The capital asset pricing model is used everywhere in finance, but it's only a model. And the central question is how good does it actually perform in the real world? And my answer is in some ways it performs very well and in some ways it also performs very bad. Let me show you what I mean by that. Quick review of the capital asset pricing model. The capital asset pricing model starts with one central assumption. Every investor only cares about the return and volatility of his or her overall position. And from that, there are two things that logically follow. The first thing is that the market portfolio is equal to the tangency portfolio. And the second thing is the security market line. It tells you that the return of an asset depends on whether how the asset is correlated with the market portfolio. But now in the real world, of course, people care about more than just return and volatility. So the question is, do those two statements still hold in the real world? And I'm going to first talk about statement one, tangency portfolio is equal to the market portfolio, and then about statement two, the security market line. So let's start with statement one, whether the market portfolio is truly the tangency portfolio. And for that, I want to introduce you to a very important measure. Let's go back to our plot. If you remember this diagram, this diagram just shows you the mean volatility combinations of portfolios of five stocks I chose. And we said that within those portfolios, there's just really one portfolio that a mean volatility investor would invest in. It's this, it's the tangency portfolio. And for the tangency portfolio, we can calculate the following ratio. We can calculate the return minus the risk-free rate divided by the volatility. And if you look at it in the graph, return minus risk-free rate, well, that is this distance, right? This is the return of the tangency portfolio, and this is the risk-free rate in our case. And our denominator, the volatility, that is this distance. Because right here, that's the volatility of the tangency portfolio, and here, the volatility is zero. So if you look at it, this ratio is just the slope of the line connecting the risk-free rate to the tangency portfolio. And it actually has a name. It's called the Sharpe Ratio, after Nobel Prize winner William Sharpe. And I hope you can intuitively see that the tangency portfolio has the highest Sharpe Ratio. Look at the other portfolios. If I, for instance, connect the risk-free asset with this portfolio here, well, the slope is not as steep, so it has a lower Sharpe ratio. Same for this asset. If I connect the risk-free rate with that asset, I also don't have a slope as steep as for the tangency portfolio. So this tangency portfolio inherently has the highest Sharpe ratio. And intuitively, a mean volatility investor likes the asset with the highest Sharpe ratio. Why? Because he likes returns. And if returns of an asset are high, then the Sharpe ratio is high but he hates volatility. And if return and if the volatility of an asset is high, then the Sharpe ratio is low because the volatility is in the denominator. So a very easy trick to test if I have a really good portfolio is to look at the Sharpe ratio of that portfolio and compare it with the Sharpe ratio of the market or tangency portfolio. So with that in mind, with the Sharpe ratio in mind, let's turn to the question, is the market portfolio really the tangency portfolio? So the central question is, is the portfolio that the market holds really the tangency portfolio? Or in other words, does the market portfolio have the highest Sharpe ratio? And I want to introduce you to a study to answer that question. The study is by Eugene Fama, another Nobel Prize winner, and it was published in 2015. And what he did is he looked at 3,500 mutual funds. And he asked the question out of those 3,500 mutual funds, which of them consistently outperform the market? Or in terms of Sharpe ratios, which of them have consistently a better Sharpe ratio than the market portfolio? And here's his answer. He calculates the return of the mutual fund as the return of the fund minus the costs of the fund. Because what you cannot forget is you can either invest into the market portfolio, then you don't need to do any research at all, you don't need to hire any people at all, or you try to pick stocks, deviate from the market portfolio, but then you need to hire people to make those trades and to make a strategy 
which stocks to pick and which not to pick. So having a fund actually costs money. So he calculates those returns. And with this return, he can calculate a Sharpe ratio, right? This is the net return of the fund minus the risk-free rate divided by the volatility of the fund. And now he looks at which funds do consistently have a better Sharpe ratio than the market. And his answer is out of all 3,500 funds, only 3% consistently outperform the market. So what does that mean? Out of all people who try to be better than the market, only 3% succeed. Only 3% succeed in finding a portfolio with a better Sharpe ratio than the market portfolio. So in other words, the assumption that the market portfolio is really the portfolio with the best Sharpe ratio out there is a very good assumption to go with. Even professionals, out of 3,500 professionals who try to get portfolios with better Sharpe ratios, only 3% succeed. So you, as a retail investor, you can really believe in that statement of the cap M, telling you just invest into the market portfolio. So that conclusion of the cup M actually performs very well in practice. So let's now go to conclusion two, the security market line. Remember what it told us. The security market line poses that there's a direct relationship between the covariance or correlation of the market portfolio on any asset and the return of that particular asset. So how can we test that model in reality? Well, in reality, we can calculate the returns, right? And I will calculate the monthly returns for the Apple stock. How does it work? Well, I just take the value of the stock in a month and I divide by the value of the stock in the previous month. And in case there are dividends, I add them to the value of the stock in that month, right? So that's one way to calculate the return. Another way to calculate the return is to just use the cap M formula, the security market line, to say, okay, I have a risk-free risk rate, it's about 2%. Then I calculate the covariance of the stock I wanna test the cap M with. So in our case, it will be Apple and the market. I divide by the volatility of the market, which is about 0.16, long-term historical average. And then I take the return of the market in that particular month and I subtract the risk-free rate, about 2%, and then I also get the return. And if the cap M holds, I should get about the same returns both ways, right? Our model should give us the same return that we observe in reality. So let me now show you my results. So here it is, you see two lines in this graph. The first one is the real return of Apple, the return I calculated from the stock prices of Apple. That's the purple line. And in blue, you see the prediction that I got using the cap M formula, right? That's the blue line. Let's now look how the cap M performs. In our first period, it performs rather well. In our second period, it's off a bit. In the third period, it's also off a bit. In the fourth period, off a bit. In the fifth period, prediction is really not that good. Sixth period, way off. Then we kind of have a good prediction again, good prediction again off, off, way off. So I think you get the picture. On average, we're 8% off. Really bad, by the way, in this month, right? Where we have a really big mistake between, where we have a really big deviation between the cap, capital asset pricing model prediction and the real return. So 8% off for returns, that's pretty horrific. In my view, the consensus in academia is that the security market line really does not fit the data well. It's not a good model. It's extremely off in predicting or explaining stock price or stock return data. So why is it still used in finance? Well, I think there are two main reasons. The first one is people have been using it forever. And people like what they've been doing, so they just keep using it. And the second one is that it's true. There is some relation between the correlation of an asset with the market portfolio and its return. So using the cap M is a bit better than guessing, right? If you guess, you're right 50% of the time. If you use the cap M, you're right 55% of the time. So you're a bit better. 
you're still not good, you're still off 45% of the time, but you're at least a bit better than casting. So that's, in my opinion, why people still use the cap hand. So wrapping up our chapter on the theory of financial markets, what do we learn? The price or return of assets is determined by supply and demand. And the demand of investors critically depends on the time horizon, the return, and the risk of an asset. And then we went into the capital asset pricing model which is a world where every investor only thinks about return and volatility of assets. And in that world, we logically deduce that first, the market portfolio is equal to the tangency portfolio. In other words, if I want to invest into the tangency portfolio, I just invest into the market and we derive the security market line that the risk of an asset is just measured by the correlation of that asset with the market portfolio. And we said our first statement of the KPM, the market portfolio truly is the one with the best chart ratio out there. That is pretty close to reality. Our second equation, the security market line, does not perform that well in predicting or in explaining returns in the real world. So where does that leave us as an investor? As an investor, we now have two choices. We think the market portfolio, that's the best portfolio we can invest in. So I'm going to invest into that portfolio. Or I can say, I believe I can be better than the market portfolio. I believe I can obtain better sharp ratios than the market portfolio. I believe I'm just as smart as the top 3% of mutual fund managers in America. So I will deviate from the market. And that's what I want to do in the next lessons. I want to look at how we can actually beat the market, how we can get better sharp ratios than the market portfolio. And also how it doesn't work, which approaches out there are just plain wrong. See you in the next lesson.